Good afternoon, everyone. This is Larnie from Luminous. Um, welcome to today's webinar with um, the ASOS team. Um, let's give it a couple more minutes for everyone to um, start pouring in. I see that there's a couple more people coming in. So welcome and thank you for your time. Hello, Dr. Cottle. Can you hear me? Hi, Larnie. How are you? Oh, mm -hmm. I can. Perfect. Can you hear me? Perfect. I could hear you perfectly. Good. So let's just give it a couple more minutes um, before we kick things off. Um, I see a couple more people coming in and um, let's just give it maybe like another 30 seconds or so before we do our introduction. Sure, Larnie, I've still got this uh, attendees on hold uh, in front of my presentation asking me to start broadcast or not now. Can I just X that out because you'll do it or? Yeah, you should be able to do that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I just X it off my screen. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. Um, as more people pour in, um, you know, let's give it maybe another 30 seconds or so. Sure. It's great to have um, everyone here today on a lovely Tuesday evening. Thank you for your time. Okay, let's kick things off with a quick introduction. So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Lauren Cayetano and I'm the marketing manager here at Luminous Vision. Just a little tidbit about Luminous Vision. We are the proud inventor of intense pulse light, SLT, and the first argon photocoagulator. We are renowned for technological breakthroughs in ophthalmic light-based devices with a long list of industry gold standards. With over 50 years of presence in the eye care industry, Luminous Vision has focused on providing eye care providers with innovative therapies to preserve and improve the sight of patients worldwide. In collaboration with the American Society of Optometric Surgeons, we are bringing you a webinar series focused on the interior segment lasers and IPL technology. Joining us today is Dr. Cliff Cottle. He received his undergraduate degree from the University of Kentucky in 1991 and his optometry degree from the University of Alabama School of Optometry in 1995. He completed a residency in primary care optometry at the Northeastern State University College uh, of optometry in 1996. After practicing for several years in private practice, he joined the faculty of the University of Kentucky Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences in 2003, providing primary care and serving as an optometric education coordinator and ocular disease residency director. In 2015, Dr. Cottle became the director of clinics at University of Pikeville. Kentucky College of Optometry. He currently serves as the Director of Clinics and Assistant Dean of Clinical Affairs, designing and implementing a network of rural eye clinic services throughout Eastern Kentucky. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, board certified by the American Board of Medical Optometry and the American Board of Optometry. He has received his laser certification from Kentucky Board of Optometric Examiners. We will kick off our collaborative webinar series with a talk on laser peripheral iridotomy and capsulotomy. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your GoToWebinar panel. We'll answer the question at the end of the presentation. Now, without further ado, we'll turn over the time to Dr. Cottle. Dr. Cottle, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Larnie, and uh, and thanks for everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, I certainly want to thank uh, ASOS, the American Society of Optometric Surgeons, and Luminous for helping us to put on this uh, six-part, I believe, uh, webinar series uh, talking about lasers and minor procedures. I uh, hope you all got a chance to see um, Dr. Coyne's lecture uh, last uh, time. Uh, it was very, very um, informative on the physics and exactly how lasers work and that kind of thing and this one is designed to be a little bit more uh, clinically oriented uh, probably for those of you who do these uh, procedures regularly you may find this a little bit basic but 
Uh, we want to make sure that we reach out to folks who are interested in performing these procedures and want to know more about them you know, so that we can provide them uh, the information that they need to get started. So uh, without further ado, let's, uh, let's move on and uh, start our presentation. So today we're going to be talking about capsulotomy and iridotomy. We're going to start off with capsulotomies. You all know what, what, what uh, posterior capsule and pacification is. And uh, unlike the students, I don't really have to define that for you, but you know, it's, uh, it's a fairly common um, complication, if you will, or side effect after cataract surgery. Uh, the technical aspect of it is, is it occurs as a result of a formation of membranes uh, in active lens epithelial cell proliferation. Uh, these transform into fibroblasts and different types of elements and deposit collagen, and it results in what we all see as posterior uh, capsular pacification uh, on the uh, posterior capsule of a lens. The indications for a capsulotomy are virtually the same as what it would might be for cataract uh, extraction. You know, things like decreased VA, glare, ghost halo, subjective, subjective visual disturbances, you know, those kinds of things. So is it possible that we do these procedures on 2025 eyes? Of course it is. Uh, the same reason why we might do uh, cataract surgery on uh, 2025 eyes. It just depends on pretty much how much, you know, the glare is affecting the patient and how it's affecting their uh, activities of daily living. But as you all know, the indications are very similar uh, to cataract surgery. The types of PCO, and you know, sometimes we don't really think about so much uh, trying to define exactly what type it is. I know when we look at them, you know, we sort of look at them and it's like, well, okay, that looks like an easy capsulotomy or a hard capsulotomy. But to, to be a little bit more academic about it in the posterior uh, types of uh, fibrosis, they're really broken down into what we think of as fibrotic lenses or uh, pearled or proliferative um, uh, capsules or opacifications. And the linear ones are actually very, very common. And uh, you've seen those. I've got a picture or two of those. And also, uh, of course, there'll be a mixed variety. Anterior is one that we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on. That's also known as phimosis, where potentially the capsulorexis may have been too small or um, experienced a lot of fibrosis and contracture, and it may be actually visually significant. So we'll talk about that in just a little bit, okay? Here's a couple of pictures, um, you know, both from irounds.org uh, out in Iowa. And this is anterior capsular fibrosis or phimosis. The one on the left that you see is, you know, that's the capsulorexis. That's not the posterior capsule, of course. And you see a lot of fibrotic membrane in the peripheral part of that, uh, of, of that uh, IOL, basically, or in the front of that IOL. And, you know, that one is probably not one that necessarily needs to have anything done because when that pupil's not dilated, then um, you know, they may not have any trouble with it, but you can imagine if it's a lot smaller than that, and that's shown a little bit better on the one over on the right, although that's probably a dilated pupil as well, of course. Um, but the way in which you treat these is you see how the one on the right looks like it has sort of a sawtooth or a jagged edge. So you're basically just kind of treating the clock hours to release almost a fibrotic ring there and let it release as opposed to the different types of patterns that we're going to discuss a little bit when we do a posterior capsulotomy. But to be complete, I wanted to mention anterior capsular fibrosis or phimosis, and that is something that we potentially would do uh, in terms of uh, calling it a capsulotomy. We're just doing it on the anterior portion. Here's the more typical type. Here's a, here's a fibrotic one up in the upper left, uh, more the proliferative in the, in the lower right. Uh, that's clearly a linear one in the upper right. There, where you have these sort of strands uh, that are uh, going across the lens there. And down in the lower left is maybe a little bit of a mixed one. There's a couple of little strands there and then uh, some proliferation. So these are the befores. This is something that you're all very, very familiar with, okay? Uh, PCO, you know, very, very common uh, quote complication of cataract surgery. Um, it can occur days to years postoperatively. Somewhere in the neighborhood, uh, depending on who you read, uh, 30 to 50% within the first three to five years. Uh, a little bit more common, of course, as you go along because the fibrosis has more time to work and younger patients seem to be a little bit uh, higher risk. I think this is all something everyone's pretty familiar with. What do these lasers look like? This is a, a one that we have in our clinic, okay? Um, this is a neodymium NAT YAG uh, laser uh, for posterior capsulotomy. Uh, you see it has a, the neodymium uh, ions in a crystal matrix of yttrium aluminum garnet. That's where we get this ND YAG. 
Um, it is a 1064 nanometer laser, meaning that the uh, that the wavelength that this uh, laser operates on is not visible. Okay, um, so that's why when you see any of these happening, you're not seeing any kind of colors or anything. All you see is the uh, is the aiming beams. It's Q switched, and um, you know Alyssa really talked about that really really well in the last uh, lecture. If you didn't hear about it, but that basically allows a whole lot of energy to come out very very quickly. And um, if you want more information about Q-Switched, I, I invite you to check that out uh, either on the web or check out hers, okay? Uh, because it'll tell you a little bit more about the physics of how that works. The tissue interaction with uh, capsulotomy or with a, with a gag laser in this case um, is known as photodisruption. And it basically forms a shock wave that travels upstream towards the source of the energy, i.e. that's anterior to the point of focus, it's towards you, okay? And due to this phenomenon, it's really, really important that we uh, understand this concept of offset for the laser focus. Um, it has to be offset behind the, the capsule in order to uh, avoid pitting the lens. And I've got a little bit better picture of that here. It's just a crude drawing, but the idea is, is that the big gray thing there is supposed to be the implant. The yellow thing is the capsule, okay? And by pushing the focal point of that laser back a couple of hundred microns or so, you see that shock wave comes forward and it just affects the capsule as opposed to pitting the lens, all right? Now that 250 microns is fairly typical for a lot of lasers. Some of them do adjust down to 100 and a quarter, up to maybe 500. The ones that uh, really just have an anterior or a posterior offset, it's going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 250 microns. So that's really, really important when you set your laser that you do this with an appropriate offset. Here's a picture of one, okay? Um, you see in this particular laser, it's showing you uh, uh, either a zero there on the right, okay? Or if you move the, the thing down towards where it says post to your offset, then it's showing you in this particular laser, it either has a 150 micron offset or a 250 micron offset. Here's some more pictures of laser controls, okay? Um, the one I've got arrowed there is a typical setting for most uh, gag capsulotomy procedures, okay? Um, about 250 uh, microns of posterior offset. You see a little window at the very top, right? Uh, the counter is zero. That's just where we're starting. The number of bursts in YAG lasers can be from one to three, and there would be really no reason to use any more than one burst at a time. So that's set to one. The next one is just an aiming beam, and then the bottom one is the power, okay? The power setting for these particular procedures is usually uh, in the neighborhood of one to two. Um, I would say probably uh, one to one and a half is a is a is a really really common setting. Okay, so in in order to perform this procedure, the preoperative checklist that we want to run through with the patient, of course, is to confirm the diagnosis, maybe to consider a PAM uh, and a MAC OCT to make sure that you know that just like with cataract surgery that you can expect that this patient is going to see better postoperatively, right? Let's do a DFE to make sure that there are no predisposing factors. Um, to um, eat, uh, to especially things like uh, retinal detachment or you know anything in the macula that may be uh, something that you want to record prior to performing the procedure. Uh, as always, we perform vitals on patients. Uh, preoperatively, we dilate them, of course. Uh, preoperatively, we use either apiclonidine or bromonidine um, a half hour or so before. And then uh, we use an anesthetic uh, for the lens if it's used. Informed consent, super important, folks, okay? Don't forget, when you do procedures on people, if you don't do informed consent, it's virtually assault, all right? So uh, make that sound really, really, really scary because it kind of is. Informed consent is super important that you inform the patient about what you plan to do, what are risk, benefits, alternatives, to treatment. That's super, super important and something we really, really push uh, hard with our students and our, and our training docs. For this particular uh, procedure, you can use uh, a capsulotomy lens. You don't have to on this one, but um, a lot of folks do. I don't know what the numbers are out there, but probably more use them than not, okay? And it's used to control the blinking. You magnify the capsule a little bit, and you actually increase the cone angle a little bit to uh, increase the efficiency of the laser focus, okay, and decrease a little bit of the uh, potential to, um, uh, to, uh, to uh, raise the temperature of the cornea, okay? In the laser settings, right, as we mentioned before, it's a 1064 uh, YAG laser. Uh, the typical power settings are between one and one and a half millijoules, single burst, 250 micron offset. And the typical procedure might be anywhere from 15 to 40 shots. 
uh, with a total energy somewhere in that 25 to 75 range. That really varies, folks. Some of these really fibrotic capsules, you know, you may be, it may be 100 shots, okay? Um, I think you just need to get through it. You know, it, back in the day when we first started learning about these, there was, you know, some folks were saying 250, whatever, you know, maybe 300 microns, uh, or excuse me, uh, millijoules was uh, the most that you'd ever want to go. And then along comes vitrolysis, and now we're putting thousands and thousands of millijoules into the eye. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm not going to advocate that we do thousands of, of, of shots for uh, capsulotomies, of course, because the typical procedure, again, is that uh, in that 15 to 40 shot range. But keeping that energy, um, you know, below 100, 150, something like that, is certainly a good goal to have, but it does depend an awful lot on the, on the capsule itself, right? The goal of this treatment is a roughly a four to six millimeter opening, basically slightly larger than the undilated pupil, and avoiding any pitting or damage to the IOL, especially in the visual axis. The patterns of treatment that we use when we provide this procedure are, um, there's probably, these are probably the three most common or some variant of it. Uh, they're known as the cruciate pattern or the cross pattern, uh, the circinate round or can opener pattern, okay? And then uh, what's known as a Christmas tree. And I've got some uh, uh, some sort of photos to show you that. The, the first two there, of course, are just uh, cartoons of that with a cruciate being there on the left where you typically you would start at about 12 o'clock and go straight down through the visual axis and then come back and go to the right or to the left. Open that up a little bit and kind of forms a diamond shape when you get done. Uh, that's probably one of the more typical types of patterns that's used. In order to avoid the, um, the visual axis um, and avoid putting any pits in the visual axis, you, you can use the circular pattern that's in the upper right in this photo, okay? Also known as the can opener, right? Or maybe the, uh, the Christmas tree, which I just sort of drew there on a picture there for you, where you start, so let's say at 12 o'clock, move over towards about seven or eight, and over towards about four or five, and then join them at the bottom out of the visual axis. And then you can see that sort of looks like a Christmas tree. Immediately post-op, uh, we're going to give another drop of apiclonidine or bromonidine, whichever one you're using in clinic. Uh, wait somewhere in the neighborhood and that one to three hours and recheck the VA and the IOP. You know, I'll be really honest with you, you know, we probably wait um, at the most 45 minutes or so uh, to do that. We probably should wait a little bit longer, but, you know, we're ready to, to, to get things going and the patient's ready to go and that kind of thing. So as long as we don't see a 10 or so millimeter spike at that uh, 45 minutes or so, then we'll go ahead and discharge them. We always give them the signs and symptoms of a retinal detachment. Talk to them about the fact that they're going to uh, probably be experiencing floaters for a week or two. And we usually are spread QID uh, for seven to 10 days. We see them back in a week. Um, you know, consider a dilated exam, especially if there was any predisposing conditions. They were high myo or, you know, they had lattice or, you know, anything like that, uh, or if you had to use a lot of energy to get this one done. The more energy that you use, the more potential that there are for side effects, of course, okay? And then at that at that week visit, um, if you're ready um, and it's necessary, of course, then you may want to repeat that on the second eye, okay? Um, after that, it's a RTC as needed until uh, maybe a three-month check uh, for uh, another DFE to check on that retina. The post-operative period on these is, uh, is uh, 90 days, okay? Um, so, you know, this is the only one that's 90 days for the, the procedures that we do. So you're going to be caring for that patient in a similar way that you would, uh, you know, for cataract surgery. Some complications on these procedures. Um, the more common ones that we see are certainly IOP spike. Uh, lens pitting is one that we all, you know, certainly grimace at when it happens. It does happen. And you want to make every effort with your offset and your appropriate uh, focal point and that kind of thing to avoid that. Um, but, uh, you know, generally uh, a few pits in the lens is not really going to cause any problem at all. You just definitely want to try to avoid that in the uh, in the visual axis because there is the potential, especially when they're close together, you know, that the patient may experience, um, you know, a little bit of dyslotopsia or glare from that. Uh, inflammation happens just because you're putting laser energy into the eye. The, the less you do, the less inflammation there is. That's pretty typical. Uh, some of the less common reactions are, again, similar to uh, cataract surgery, where when you apply a lot of energy in there, then you may get cystoid macular edema. Uh, retinal detachments are always possible because you're basically tickling the anterior face of the vitreous, and anytime you do anything with that, then there is a potential for 
uh, CME and, uh, and retinal detachment. Uh, you can get something like prolapse, if the, especially if the capsulotomy is too large. Okay? Uh, it is possible to rupture the anterior hyaloid face. Usually you're not going to be doing that. There's a phenomenon known as plasma shielding that I don't know if Dr. Coyne talked about that or not, but um, you know, that basically protects the back of the eye from you know, the effects of the laser. And that's why vitreolysis is so quote unquote safe for the retina because there's really not much energy that goes beyond the focal point. And that's because the plasma shock wave basically shields the, um, the posterior portion of the eye uh, from the energy that's being applied. So uh, that's a good thing for us. So usually we're not doing things like rupturing hyaluronic bases or causing CME, but it does depend on how much energy that you put in there. And of course the uh, individual patients can be different. Complications that are really rare. I have to be complete on these. You know, these are in some of the texts and all these kinds of things. You know, these are out there. You know, things like iris hemes and vitreous hemes and ophthalmitis and all that kind of stuff. They are they are possible, and I guess they're documented somewhere. But you know, that's a that's a very very low risk. Uh, here's some results, some before and afters. Uh, these are actually our patients here at the clinic in uh, in Kentucky. Um, you see, you've seen this one before at the top when I showed you the demonstration of a type of, uh, you know, a, a proliferation of the capsule. And so that was the cloudiness that the patient was experiencing. Uh, the lower left, I believe, is their eye, actually, postoperatively. It's one of these um, over here, or maybe, maybe it's the same one, okay? Uh, but you can see in both of those images on the bottom, this fairly nice diamond shaped pattern, okay? One in retro there in the lower right and one in, in normal uh, uh, illumination there on your left. So pre-op uh, above, post-op uh, below with a nicely sized, a nice and clear uh, capsulotomy. This is a procedure I'd like you all to see, okay? Uh, it's a little difficult to see this. Um, please pipe up, uh, Larnie or anybody, if you are if you can't see it at all. The beginning of this is a little bit blurry and a little hard to see, and I apologize for that. But the later it goes in the procedure, the better it is. And this is one that we did as part of the laser course in Alabama. And you can see that this doc is doing a circular type pattern. So he started at about 12 o'clock and he's going counterclockwise. Again, a little hard to see, but it gets better and better as you go around. But you see now he's come around to about uh, seven o'clock or so, okay? Getting a little bit better in the video. You can see that clearing up. Now you can start to see it really, really good, okay? Where he's coming around the corner there, back up now around three o'clock, okay? And coming back around to the, to the top, okay? You see that there and you notice that there's a pretty significant floater. You're going to see that when this lady moves her eye, okay? And that's part of the downside, if you will, to doing the circinate pattern is you do leave a, a potentially a pretty large floater. It's going to come flying by here in just a second, okay? Uh, there it is, okay? So, you know, that's the difference between that and the cruciate pattern. So he was never in the visual axis, which is a good thing, of course, but um, there is the potential for that large floater. A lot of times, of course, patients don't see those just like any other floater. Okay. Very good. All right. So the, uh, the a quick thing about the reimbursement on these, at least in Kentucky, it's uh, $281. Uh, again, the global period is 90 days on that. Okay. And uh, one of our formal fac former faculty members did a little quick uh, return on investment that might interest uh, a lot of folks. And you know, this is on, you know, lasers cost anywhere from, you know, 20 to probably $35,000, depending on, this is new, uh, depending on the brand and some of the features. And so there's some figures up here that, uh, you know, I'll leave you with, and you can take a look at those, but you can see that, you know, basically to get your, get your money back on a year plan, you're looking at six to seven procedures per month, okay? And in a four-year plan, you know, two to three procedures a month, and uh, then you're you're potentially profiting at it from there. So uh, that's a common question that we get, or you know, so how long is it going to take me to break even? What do they cost and that kind of thing? So I wanted to provide you with some information. The part two of this uh, of this presentation on anterior segment lasers uh, involves the peripheral iridotomy. So uh, let's move on and we'll get started on, on PIs. Indications for PIs, right? Really the main indication is any form of angle closure glaucoma that has a pupillary block component, right? It's very, very important that 
you know, pupillary block be at least a component of what's going on because that's really what an LPI can treat, right? If there's not, not a pupillary block component, we'll talk about that a little bit, then it really may not be very effective for patients, right? So what's pupillary block? Here's the definition, okay? Just when you can't get the aqueous, can't go around the lens. And so it pushes the iris up, okay? Again, that's the academic definition, but what's that look like, okay? So, you know, here's a little graph at the top. So instead of the fluid flowing out, you know, around uh, the pupil, then it can't get out there. So it's pushing up on the iris and you see it in the cartoon at the top, okay? And then you see it on an anterior segment OCT very vividly in that picture in the bottom, okay? So as that continues to push up like that, of course, it narrows the anterior chamber angle and the pressure rises, right? Here's a, one of our patients, okay? Um, you see uh, this, this one was actually performed at, uh, I believe that's at uh, three o'clock on her. Um, and you can see that in the top portion of the anterior seg OCT, it's in the middle in this picture, then you can see how the angle, uh, the anterior chamber angle is relatively narrow, okay? And then the, uh, look at the angle of the, uh, of the, uh, excuse me, the concavity of the iris here, okay? And then after this is done, okay, and you look at the bottom, you see the hole there, okay? Look at the plane of the iris. Look at the difference in the plane of the iris in the bottom picture and in the top picture. It's not as dramatic as in that first case, in that first anterior seg OCT, because that first one was probably actually acute angle closure of glaucoma where the pressure was really high, okay? This one was one of those uh, more occlutable angles, uh, narrow angle um, that was uh, referred to us and since it did have this pupillary block component with that bowing of the iris, then it did respond fairly well to, uh, to an LPI. So again, the indications for this acute uh, angle closure glaucoma, of course, is the one that we've all uh, grown up with knowing that that was what we did. You know, they came in and they had the typical uh, angle closure uh, symptoms and signs. You know, then you throw everything you got at them and you'd send them off for an LPI. Well, the difference is now that you're going to throw everything at them and then you're going to do the LPI potentially, okay, uh, to relieve that pupillary block and to lower the pressure. Also, uh, pigment dispersion uh, syndrome uh, and pigment dispersion in glaucoma or pigmentary glaucoma uh, because of the concavity or the convexity of the iris, okay, pushing against, um, you know, the lens and causing the pigment to come out. You can also uh, flatten out the iris plane in the same idea by providing a PDI, but it's just in the opposite. So the iris now is pushed back against the lens, causing the pigment dispersion, uh, as opposed to being pushed up because of the pupillary block. Something like phacomorphic glaucoma, same type of idea is you're, 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 you're pushing against it as, it, as it, uh, the concavity of the lens increases, pushing against the iris, reduces the ability for the fluid to get out around the pupil and results in pupillary block. Or what we think of as eyes with occludable angles, and that's ones that we look at with a slit lamp and then maybe with gonio, and we're not seeing as many structures as we think is appropriate. And a very important point here about eyes with occludable angles, okay, is, is that it's important that you're able to um, use indentation gonioscopy and see more structures. That tells you there's pupillary block component. And I hope that's not too confusing, but the, the issue is, is that when you're doing gonioscopy and you see, just making this up, Schwalbe's, okay, and you indent the cornea a little bit, all right, and now you open it up to ciliary body or trabeculum or scleros or whatever, you're seeing more structures, then you know that there is a pupillary block component because you can use the hydraulic pressure in the front of the eye by pushing on the cornea to push that iris back, right? And if that happens, you know that there may be a pupillary block component and that may be an indication for an LPI, okay? So watch out for those other things, you know, there may be pressure, uh, when you see the patient, there may not. It may be intermittent. It may be when they go to a movie or a dark room or whatever. So you'll hear patients sometimes say that I have intermittent eye pain, headaches, those kinds of things. And in the presence of really, really narrow angles that do respond to indentation gonioscopy, that may be a good indication for an LPI. Something else to consider, there's more information coming out in the world, uh, you know, relatively lately. This is called the ZAP study. This was uh, performed in, in uh, China, okay? And they were really trying to determine if uh, angle closure prevention in patients, this is not patients with acute angle closure, this is uh, the, a Chinese population with occludable angles. And according to this study, it really only offered a, a modest risk reduction in progression to 
angle closure glaucoma, uh, glaucoma or development of field loss or, or uh, you know, nerve damage or anything like that. So more to come on this, but, you know, we're really starting to find out that there is a possibility that, you know, we may or may not really be doing much for those patients with these occludable angles. For angle closure glaucoma, different story, of course, but these are the ones with the occludable angles, you know, whether or not they're actually going to develop, um, you know, uh, glaucoma from that condition, you know, may or may not, um, you know, actually uh, come to pass. So something to consider, and I wanted to offer that out there to folks who, who may want to, to check that out because uh, we may be starting to, to change our thinking again on these occludable angles. So another condition that we notice when we're working with these patients with uh, potentially occludable angles or maybe narrow angles that we see on, um, on, uh, on slit lamp is something known as plateau iris configuration and or syndrome that you, you remember learning about and, and having to learn about for boards and that kind of thing. And, you know, whether or not you see it a whole lot, you know, I feel like I see it more just because we're getting patients that are referred in for occludable angles as opposed to you know, the number of patients that we would be seeing in a primary care clinic, you know, just with narrow angles. Um, but really, what's the difference? I mean, plateau iris configuration is an anatomical issue, okay, an anatomical anomaly, if you will, of, of the, uh, the iris, you know, uh, uh, morphology, okay. Syndrome, you know, basically is, is pressure and glaucoma. So, if patients have high pressure, from this anatomical uh, morphology and glaucoma, then they call it plateau iris syndrome. If they have plateau iris configuration, i.e. no pressure spikes or pressure increase and no glaucoma, we, we call it plateau iris configuration. It's an interesting uh, condition and one that uh, when you see it on gonioscopy is, is, is usually fairly uh, uh, easy to detect. Uh, this is from uh, what's called the glaucoma curriculum at the uh, University of Iowa. If you haven't checked that out, it's called um, uh, gonioscopy.org, and they're very open with their, um, you know, with their material on there, and they're happy to have people come on and check it out and see it. It's a curriculum that they use to train their residents. But um, the, this this doc um, has has done a lot of work with gonioscopy for the residents there, and has a great curriculum. So if you haven't checked it out, uh, I certainly encourage you. But this is a drawing from this curriculum, and he's showing you that. When you perform indentation gonioscopy, like we talked about before, and that iris is being pushed down in the mid periphery because of the hydraulic pressure, it's still staying at the uh, at the lens. It's still staying up. You know, the, the lens is behind it, and this anteriorly displaced um, ciliary body, okay, um, in this area right here, okay, oops, sorry, um, in this area right here. I don't know if my pen's up there. Uh, let's see. Here we go right in here okay here's the anteriorly displaced ciliary body okay and that's showing you uh, that basically when the iris is pushed down like that it stays up in this area okay and stays up in this area right but gets pushed down right here okay and so when you see it on gonio then you see this a uh, double hump pattern or this sine wave pattern okay so here's an, an image this is also from gonioscopy.org okay and uh, so here's where it's uh, it's being pressed up by the lens or it's pushing on the lens. Here's where it's pressing on the ciliary body. And down below here, you know, he's trying to show you here that that is being pushed away, okay? And, and so this is sort of the double hump. So it goes here and goes down in here, okay? I don't know if y'all can see that or not, but, but here's the one hump, okay? Here's the other hump, all right? And then it's being pushed down in this area right here, okay? Uh, here's an image uh, from one of our patients on the bottom, okay, uh, showing what we believe to be uh, plateau iris syndrome, right? You see a relatively narrow angle, but mainly by approach. You can imagine that if you're looking in this direction with gonioscopy, okay, then you may have trouble viewing a lot of these structures here, okay? But it turns out it's fairly open because it just drops off like a, you know, just like a hole down in here because of this anteriorly displaced ciliary body and this flat, you know, uh, sort of, um, you know, obviously plateau uh, shape to the to the iris itself. So it's an interesting condition and, and one that when you see a narrow angle, get out that gonio lens, make sure it's the small, you know, like a four mirror or something like that, that you can do indentation gonioscopy and try to determine if you think this is plateau iris as opposed to, um, you know, one of the other conditions, okay?
Sorry, I'm having trouble with my mouse here. Okay, so quick gonioscopy uh, review. Okay, you all have seen this before. Okay, um, let's see here. Okay, sorry. Uh, so this is the iris, okay, of course, right? That's a no-brainer, I think, for most people. Here's the ciliary body, all right, the dark brown band, right? Remember the scleral spur, okay? And here's the trabecular meshwork, right? Remember, a posterior and an anterior portion. Posterior part is the pigmented portion, okay? Uh, this is a uh, Schwabe's line, right? This is important for an SLT procedure that you're going to hear about, I think, in subsequent um, uh, webinars, but this is the aiming point for the SLT procedure that uh, some of you may be very familiar with, okay? And a bonus point there is sample AC slide. But the point of this is, is that I want to make sure that you're that you're up on your gonio, you know, uh, when you're thinking about LPIs, again, because of the necessity for um, you to determine that there's a pupillary block component, make sure you review your structures and that you understand what you're seeing and that when you push on the eye a little bit, you're getting an improvement in the visible structures so that you're able to determine whether or not they're a good candidate for the procedure. Okay. Um, for the workup for the LPI folks, uh, a comprehensive exam, make sure you confirm the diagnosis as we've just been discussing, right? Um, and do a DFE to make sure that uh, everything in the back is okay. Uh, again, that's a pretty, uh, it's a, it's a pretty common, um, you know, workup procedure for most folks, unless they've had a, you know, a very recent DFE and they may, may or may not have because a lot of these patients have been sent because they're concerned about their ability to diagnose or excuse me to dilate them okay uh so that could be something to consider right uh the question always comes up about what are you going to do are you going to do the dfe or not okay and a, a lot of times what we do if the patients have had a, a dfe in the last five years no flashes floaters anything like that um, and they have really really narrow angles we'll go on and perform the procedure and then, of course, um, you know, within a week or so, get them back in and get them dilated so we can make sure that there's nothing else that needs to be addressed by retina. But it's sort of a chicken and the egg thing. When they have these really narrow angles, how do you decide if you're going to do the procedure or dilate them first? You know, some folks do the provocative test. They know they, they, they call it and, you know, they go on and dilate the patient. And if they close, then, you know, they're ready to do the LPI and they go ahead and fix it. You know, I don't think that's really the way we approach these, you know, for the most part. If they're really, really narrow and we're, you know, we're confident in our diagnosis, then we'll go ahead and do the procedure and then bring them back for the DFE, okay? Um, a pre-op uh, is vision, of course, uh, pressure, med, allergy, tech, vitals, the, the standard stuff. Uh, again, we're going to use uh, preoperative bromonidine and alpidine to control ILP spikes, right? And uh, pilocarpine, uh, 1%, you want to stretch that iris nice and tight. Uh, it's a whole lot easier to be able to punch through when the iris is uh, is is biotic uh, from pilocarpine. And I can't stress enough, again, informed consent to make sure that the patient understands the risk and benefits of the procedure. This lens uh, that's used for this procedure, uh, it must be used, in my opinion. Uh, I have heard of, of docs that don't, but, you know, in my opinion, this is an absolute have to because of your ability to control one of the major complications that we're going to talk about in just a second. But it also really uh, increases the cone angle like we talked about, the magnification as we mentioned in the other procedure. Uh, but when you're trying to focus in on an iris crypt, you really want to be able to see that thing in a very, very magnified um, view so that you can try to find the thinnest portion of the iris that you can find. So, and again, in my opinion, these, uh, these laser lenses uh, for these laser iridotomy lenses uh, are crucial uh, to be used, uh, you know, for this procedure. Again, here's some of the reasons why, you know, again, you're going to control that eye, you focus the energy of the laser about the cone angle, works like a speculum, you know, that kind of thing. But more importantly, uh, it'll help control uh, one of the most uh, common complications, and we'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, what are those, uh, what are the laser procedures here? Notice that this is a still an NDEAG procedure. It's, still, it's the same laser that we used in capsulotomy, but the setting is quite a bit higher, somewhere in the neighborhood of three to six millijoules. This can be performed with an argon or a green diode laser, right? Um, that's a thermal laser that actually applies, uh, you know, thermal energy 
um, to the to the to the iris, and uh, you know we'll we'll burn it just a little bit. That's a thermal laser. Okay. Um, the advantages to that is is that it will help with um, the, the reduce the risk of bleeding because you're basically cauterizing uh, blood vessels as you as you perform the LPI as opposed to using the photo disruption that you have with uh, with the uh, the standard YAG. Okay. The thermal one, you know, may require a little bit more energy. The YAG is is really the most accepted method, I think, just because you know folks who are doing these anterior segment procedures uh, uh, may not have access to a green laser. It's typically used with retina, and, you know, and that kind of thing. So uh, it's it's a little bit more accepted, I think, to use the YAG. But you have to be careful uh, because there is the possibility, um, you know, for uh, for hemorrhage. Okay. Uh, the treatment location, the conventional wisdom is around 11 o'clock or 1 o'clock. Um, you want to stay away from the 12 o'clock position because what's going to happen is, is that you're going to have bubble formation. And if you have bubbles that form and go straight up to the top of the eye, then it will occlude your ability to complete the procedure. Okay. And you can't see where you're trying to hit. So conventional wisdom has basically been 11 and 1. Okay. Uh, so that you can avoid the bubble issue, okay, and it's going to be tucked up underneath the eyelid to avoid dysphotopsia. However, there is a, a fairly um, uh, a popular paradigm shift towards putting these at the three and nine o'clock position, okay, uh, and there's a, a long complicated couple of articles about how they actually cause less uh, dysphotopsia when they're at three or nine o'clock, um, because of a small tear prism that may be um, present at the upper lid when it so it's basically unless it completely covers it in the upper lid then you may actually have a little tear prism and you get some off-axis uh, light rays that are coming in and causing the patient's dysphotopsia as opposed to one at three or nine that they may notice it very very early after the procedure but their brain turns it off just like it turns off a lot of all of off excuse me off-axis uh, light rays. So look out for that. You may see these in some of your patients or you may see these in docs that you work with or um, you know as we continue to do these procedures we may find that this becomes a little bit more popular especially with those people that have really really wide apertures okay um, and where when you put one up at the top then you know it may not make any difference one way or the other uh, but if you get too close to the edge of that lid then again you may have that problem with the dysphotopsia. The size, you know, roughly a millimeter, millimeter and a half, something like that. Honestly, the, the, the appropriate size is the one that stays open, okay? Um, and, you know, you don't want to get crazy with it, but, um, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of a millimeter, millimeter and a half, as long as it looks like it's nice and open is, uh, is a good way to do it. Here's a, here is a procedure that is performed. This is right from Root Atlas, so you can find this on the web, but I think it shows you a good, um, a good procedure here, okay? Um, so basically, he's going to tell you that he's focusing the uh, aiming beam. Here's the lens going on the eye. See what, what kind of a better view that you have. And he's going to show you that, okay, I'm looking for a crypt here because that's already a, a thinner portion, okay, um, of, the, uh, of the iris, okay. And so what he's going to do here is he's going to go ahead and apply the energy and take a few shots here. And his narration tells you that he's looking for that flow of pigment and, and fluid to come rushing from the posterior chamber towards the anterior chamber, okay? And after two or three shots, there's a little bit, you see, that's slowing down, okay? It's falling down towards the bottom right now. A little bit better magnified view, and he's going to take another shot or two, and there's a very clear gush, okay, of pigment and uh, fluid from the hole to the anterior portion of the eye, okay? And then he just opens it up a little bit with a couple more shots to try to make sure that it stays patent, okay? You know, unfortunately, they don't all go like this. Um, you know, if they did, um, you know, it would be it would be uh, certainly a lot easier, more simpler for a lot of us. But you know, there are potential complications that occur um, intraoperatively, and the number one is probably a uh, hemorrhage that occurs, especially intraoperatively. Okay, these scare you when it happens to you the first time, but this is really, really common. If you get to doing these, you're going to have some for sure. Okay. So don't let it freak you out too bad. Uh, some of them look really scary and develop into, you know, what you might consider micro um, that kind of thing. We don't typically ask patients to stop any blood thinners or aspirin or anything like that because these are generally very, very easily controlled um, with just a little bit of uh, pressure. Okay. So 
that's usually, uh, and, uh, again, generally pretty easy to control. So you just push a little bit and that'll, uh, that'll go away. Um, I'll, you know, uh, IOP spikes, uh, the, the complications that occur with these things like IOP spikes, transient uveitis, that's typical, you know, uh, for these folks. Um, but we don't, uh, we don't see uh, that occurring too often, but they're, they're usually pretty transient and respond really well to topical IOP meds and or steroids, okay? So we usually put these people on steroids postoperatively for about a week, okay? Some other complications, we talked about the placement of the, uh, of the, uh, of the iridotomy itself. There's a potential for diplopia and glare. Uh, it can close up on you. You know, the, con the confirmation of patency can be a challenge. You know, we used to just do that with uh, trans elimination, but that can fool you, all right? And anterior, uh, anterior segment of OCT is very valuable to really determine if you're already, uh, excuse me, if you're all the way through uh, the iris itself. So you're going to check the IOP, uh, you know, roughly an hour afterwards, uh, send them off with uh, topical PRED and recheck uh, five to seven days. Global period on this um, is only 10 days, right? So a quick summary there, you know, confirm with gonioscopy, think about indentation gonioscopy. You can do it with a YAG laser or green laser or both, right? Uh, remember to pre-treat uh, with pilocarpine because that makes the procedure much easier and uh, the standard IOP pre-treatments. Uh, pre um, consider the temporal placement. That's something relatively new for folks um, uh, now, but you may see that uh, in, in your patients. Post office spread and recheck in a week in Kentucky. This reimburses at a little over $300, okay? That's the end of my slideshow, right? Um, I'll turn it back over to Larney for just a minute. And if we have some questions, then potentially we can try to get those answered here in the last few minutes. Perfect, thank you so much, Dr. Cottle. Um, we will go ahead and take some time for questions now. Just a reminder, please be sure to type your questions in the questions box in your control panel. Um, first question that came in from Cameron Norman. What is your clinical criteria for making relaxing incision on anterior uh, phimosis? Do you do it on all visible anterior uh, phimosis in what locations? Uh, well, I don't know if I have a specific clinical criteria. Um, I, I, I don't do it on all locations. Um, if we perform these, it, it has to be smaller than, you know, their undilated pupil or they're having, uh, you know, glare complaints, you know, and those kinds of things. Uh, most of the time, it depends on the nature of the fibrosis. If it's really, really thick, it may require one of the, the small incisions, um, you know, basically at every clock hour, right? Uh, some of the ones that are maybe a little bit um, less fibrosed, uh, then we may be able to get away with, you know, just uh, 3, 9, 12, and 6. I hope that answers your question. The next question we have is from Austin um, Lefferth. Um, do you decide to do LPI for primary angle closure suspects based on your gonio appearance or the AS? dash OCT or both. Hi, Austin. It's nice to hear from you. Uh, both, by all means. You know, if we have anterior segment OCT, that certainly helps us, especially to try to screen out a little bit of the, the, uh, the folks who might have plateau iris, because sometimes you may not see that double hump very well. So if we do, we certainly do gonioscopy. We do indentation gonioscopy. If we see more structures, we know there's some pupillary block component, but we are performing intersec OCTs on all of our uh, on all of our LPI referrals to try to confirm um, basically the nature of the pupillary block and to rule out some other issues, other uh, uh, issues or conditions, especially plateau iris. Perfect. Uh, next question we have is actually from Dr. Richard Castillo. Um, Goniosal. Solopsic oh. or other? I'm mm -hmm. so sorry. I butchered all those words. <laughs> no, no, you're you're fine. That's goniosol is what you were asking about. Okay, that's uh, you know a, a particular concentration of uh, hypermethylcellulose, something like that. And then you have cellulovisc, which is basically a, a over the counter, a thick artificial tear. And that's a really good question, Dr. Castillo, because one of the problems, of course, is, is goniosol and gonac 
Gonak just came back. I mean, you know, Gonak is 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 finally back out there again. Um, it sticks better, there's no doubt, right? But causes a lot more, um, you know, irritation to corneas. So what we have been using right now is we have been using Genteel Gel, basically because of the lack of availability for Goniosol and or Gonak. But I did just pick up a few bottles of Gonak, and I think for the laser procedures especially, we will probably go back to Gonak, but for Gonio and that kind of thing, we're going to be sticking with, um, you know, either if it's indentation, we may not use any at all, or if we're doing three mirror or something like that, then we're probably going to use uh, Genteel Gel. Perfect. Next question we have is from Yvette Mercado. Why temporal for the PI? Would it cause more glare? Yeah, that's a really, really great question and, and one we get because when I first heard about this, I said the same thing. So why in the world would you want to do it there? Um, but there, there is an article or two out there and they go through, um, you know, the specific optics of why that the uh, 11 or 1 o'clock position may result in dyslotopsia because of that tear prism, okay? and why a three and not a nine o'clock position doesn't okay and uh so i'm sorry that i can't answer that specifically for you but i will tell you if you research temporal placement on um on peripheral iridotomies you will find a couple of scholarly articles on the specifics of the optics but what these couple of articles are telling us is is that the there is actually less dyslotopsia on folks with the three and nine placement so if you have people who don't have uh, or have a relatively large aperture or, you know, don't have a lot of, you know, ptosis or it's not around, you know, it's not, it's not, uh, their lid isn't below the upper portion of their iris, then I think consideration for a temporal placement uh, is in order. Perfect. Next question we have is from Dr. James Carroll. What was the cause of anterior capsular fibrosis? How is it different from PCO? Uh, that's a really good question, and I, I, I can't tell you that I know specifically what the difference is. Um, I mean, in terms of how they develop, okay? Uh, I, we know what the difference is, and whether they're anterior or posterior, but I, I don't know the answer to that question, Doc. I really don't. Okay. Next question we have is from Dr. David Monroe. What angle degree on interior segment OCT would you consider narrow? Five degrees, 10, 15, 20 degrees? Less than 20. Okay, next question we have from Dr. Richard. I hope Richard that answered Cicillo. your question, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot of questions pouring in. Next question again is from Dr. Richard Casillo. <laughs> Do you take any particular precautions when performing these laser procedures in the COVID era? Uh, we don't take any, I don't guess any particular uh, precautions, but we use this, the same ones as we always do. Of course, uh, both the examiner or the, uh, the provider and the patient uh, do continue to wear masks. We have uh, shields on the slit lamps uh, and that kind of thing. So. Um, we don't take any particular precautions in the COVID era, but all of our precautions, of course, are in place, um, you know, when we're doing these procedures. So it's masks, gloves, it's, you know, all those kinds of things, but nothing really different. Uh, it always confuses us or, or, or makes things more difficult because of the fogging and that kind of thing. So we are having sometimes to take masks down, you know, and that kind of thing. Uh, as we have been in slit lamps and everything else. But obviously, it's very, very critical that you are able to visualize things. So uh, I think the particular precautions for us are taping masks and making sure that we're reducing the chance of fogging. Perfect. And um, we'll quickly wrap up um, soon. We'll take one uh, more question here uh, from Char Dr. Charles Fitzpatrick. Does dense um, Arcus senilis complicate or alter your approach to the application of an LPI? Uh, yeah, to some degree. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen a dense enough that uh, it didn't enable me to get where I wanted to. But let's remember that you really need to put that thing out, the, to put the PI out there in the outer one third of the iris. 
you don't want to be getting in close to the mid periphery at all okay so that certainly could complicate it because if you can't visualize it for whatever reason and of course in certain races that can be very very dense so that's a really great point um, but you know the basically a contraindication of the procedure is the inability to, to visualize the area whether that be a capsulotomy or a PI so for whatever reason if you have you know corneal edema or a scar or haze or whatever's going on if you can't visualize it then that certainly is a contraindication and a very very good point perfect um and with that you know i want to give us a couple minutes to um basically conclude this webinar um dr cottle thank you very much for this very wonderful um webinar uh, we got a lot of uh you know feedback saying that this is a great lecture and um you know again thank you uh asos for collaborating with luminous and bringing these educational um content out to um our doctors um any parting words dr cottle or dr Casillo? oh sure thank you so much for your uh for your support of asos and for your initiation of these uh of these uh, of this webinar series uh, i think it's a great start and a great kickoff to uh, uh you know training docs in in areas that they uh that, that they want to move into so i want to thank you for your uh for your uh, participation in this event perfect well we are looking forward to the next um you know series um we will have our next webinar in the next three weeks i believe it will be on october 27th uh, which is laser um laser slt basically i'm sorry um i was trying to read the schedule yes um and we'll send over invites mm -hmm. to the next uh webinar thank you all so much and i hope you guys all have a great evening Perfect. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you.